Okay. This is a contribution that Dr. Jason J. Campbell asked for. Uh, he recently, about a week ago, made a video asking for a contribution uh, on his series on Nietzsche's book, The Will to Power. So I'm going to... I'm actually kind of in a hurry because I only found out about this just recently and I have to kind of be quick about this and I'm going to make his established deadline. So I'm going to be as in-depth as I can, but I'm going to be doing this rather quickly. Okay, so the section that we're looking at is uh, the beginning of book two. Alright, so starting with note 135, we have this one's called The Origin of Religion. So obviously he is giving his own opinion on how this stuff originated. Just as the illiterate man of today believes that his wrath is the cause of his being angry, that his mind is the cause of his thinking, that his soul is the cause of his feelings, in short, just as a mass of psychological entities are still unthinkingly postulated as causes, so, in a still more primitive age, the same phenomena were interpreted by man by means of personal entities. Those conditions of his soul would seem strange, overwhelming, and rapturous. He regarded it as obsession and bewitching influences emanating from the power of some personality. Okay, so we got that. Basically, what he's saying is that he's project the religious person is projecting his own mind onto the universe. Thus, the Christian, the most puerile and backward man of the stage. Now, Nietzsche is rather famous for having little, if anything, positive to say about Christianity. He frequently regards its moral system as the most bankrupt state one could imagine. Traces hope, peace, and the feeling of deliverance to a psychological inspiration on the part of God, being by nature a sufferer and a creature in need of repose, states of happiness, peace, and resignation. Her force seemed strange to him and seemed to need some explanation. Among intelligent, strong, and vigorous reasons, the epileptic is mostly the cause of a belief in the existence of some foreign power. But all such examples of apparent subjection, as, for instance, the bearing of the exalted man, of the poet, of the great criminal, or the passion, love, and revenge, lead to the invention of supernatural powers. Now, notice that near the beginning of that sentence, he describes the religious person as an epileptic among a strong and vigorous race. Now, he obviously does not think this is a good thing. He thinks that religion is a sign of weakness, and one of the reasons why humanity has gone to the dogs, essentially, is because of this kind of dogma and weakness, the weakness of the weak, of the weak is the cause of their inventing a supernatural realm. Nietzsche continues. A condition is made concrete by being identified with a personality, and when this condition overtakes anybody, it is ascribed to that personality. In other words, in the psychological concept of God, a certain state of the soul is personified as a cause in order to appear as an effect. So again, we have somebody projecting his own mind onto nature. The psychological logic is as follows. When the feeling of power suddenly seizes and overwhelms a man, and this takes place in the case of all the great passions, a doubt arises in him concerning his own person. He dare not think himself the cause of this astonishing sensation, and thus he causes a stronger person, a godhead, as his cause. Okay, so here we go. A person here is so weak, that whenever he feels a passion, whenever he feels strength, he has a hard time believing that he could possibly be the cause of it. So he invent, invents a being outside of himself, namely God, or I would argue the devil, 
as the cause of these passions. And I, the reason why I would argue that it's the devil that's uh, being projected here instead of God is because you have Christianity values things like meekness. They value that you suppress, at least in most cases, some of your emotions. So what we have here is Satan is the cause of these emotions, and you have to suppress them in order to appease God and have eternal life. In short, the origin of religion lies in extreme feelings of power, which, being strange, take men by surprise, and just as the sick man who feels one of his limbs unaccountably heavy concludes that another man must be sitting on it, so the ingenious homo religiosus divides himself up into several piece people. So basically, he's taking, he's dividing himself into two sides. He calls one of them God, and he ascribes to that all in him that he sees as good. And then everything else is just the imperfect nature of man, or it's Satan, or something along those lines. Back to Nietzsche. Religion is an example of the alteration of the personality, a sort of fear and sensation of terror in one's own presence, but also a feeling of inordinate rapture and exaltation. Among sick people, the sensation of health suffices to awaken a belief in the proximity of God. So in other words, as we were saying earlier, when a weak person feels strong, he has to he can't believe that it was himself doing that. He has to assume that it was someone else. On to note 136. This one's called Rudimentary Psychology of the Religious Man. All changes are effects. All effects are effects of will. The notion of nature and natural law is lacking. All effects presuppose an agent. Rudimentary psychology. One is only a cause oneself when one knows that one has willed something. So in other words, he's trying to analyze the psychology of the religious man, at least the basics of it. And the religious person, according to Nietzsche, is basically claiming that everything must be the result of some kind of will. And as Nietzsche goes on, the result of this, States of power impute to man the feeling that he is not the cause of them, that he is not responsible for them. They come without being willed to do so. Consequently, we cannot be their originators. Will that is not free, that is to say, the knowledge of a change in our condition, which we have not helped to bring out, requires a strong will. So when, that's going back to what we were saying earlier, where we have a person who cannot believe that a certain thing is him actually doing it. We established earlier that he believes that everything is the effect of some will, and Nietzsche does say there that the idea of laws of nature uh, kind of shows that, that we call the description descriptive ways in which nature behaves. Law shows that we're projecting some will onto nature. And combine that with somebody who cannot believe that his will is actually his own, and we get the invention of some kind of deity. The consequence of this rudimentary psychology, man has never dared to credit himself with his strong and startling moves. He has always conceived them as passive and imposed upon him from outside. Religion is the offshoot of a doubt concerning the entity of the person, an alteration of the personality, insofar as everything great and strong in man was considered superhuman and foreign. Man belittled himself. He laid the two sides, the very pitiable and the weak side, and the very strong and startling side apart, in two spheres, and called the one man and the other God. So that goes right back to what we were saying earlier. He cannot credit himself with his strong feelings, and so he divides his own psychology into two parts and calls one God and calls one man, or I would, again, I would argue, 
some of them would call it Satan. And there's another result of this, and it's that you often find religious people, not all religious people granted, but a lot of religious people saying things like, I'm nothing without God. Without God, I can't do anything. I'm completely powerless. And I think that that's kind of a result of what Nietzsche, Nietzsche's analysis is here. Going on, and he has continued to act upon these lines during the period of the moral idiosyncrasy, he did not interpret his lofty and sublime moral states as proceeding from his own will or as the work of the person. Even the Christian himself divides his personality into two parts. The one a mean and weak fiction which he calls man, and the other which he calls God, or deliverer, or savior. And now, Nietzsche reiterated a lot there, but this time he says one more thing. He did not interpret his lofty and sublime moral state. So what we have here is the origin of how God is the moral author. Morality is not something that man could have created, so therefore it must belong to this other side of humanity, which has been labeled God. And right in the next paragraph, he goes into some other things that we do Religion has lowered the concept of man. Its ultimate conclusion is that all goodness, greatness, and truth are superhuman and are only obtainable by the grace of God. So in other words, it's impossible to be good or it's impossible to know the truth without God. That's right what Nietzsche is getting into and I think that it is prevalent in a lot of religious people. On to note 137. One way of raising man out of his self-abasement is brought about the decline of the point of view that classed all lofty and strong states of the soul as strange was the theory of relationship. These lofty and strong states of the soul could at least be interpreted as the influence of our forebears. We belonged to each other. We were irrevocably joined. We grew in our own esteem by acting according to the example of a model known to us all. Now, I have two interpretations of that sentence. One of them, both of them involve like how we can avoid this division of humans and human psychology and belittling of humans that we saw in Christianity. The first way that I interpret this is the idea of a cosmic consciousness. He says, we belong to each other, we're irrevocably joined, etc. So it seems like he's saying that the idea that we are all part of some cosmic consciousness is a way of getting rid of that. The other way is it's those ancient religions which are more ancestor oriented. But anyway, back to what Nietzsche wrote. There is an attempt on the part of noble families to associate religion with their own feelings of self-respect. Poets and seers do the same thing. They feel proud that they have been worthy, that they have been selected for such association. They esteem it an honor, not to be considered at all as individuals, but as mere mouthpieces. Okay, so there's two points to make. First of all, it goes back into what I was discussing earlier about I can't believe that this could have been me that I could possibly deserve this therefore it was some other power that was doing this. The second thing is something that uh, I actually find just as baffling as Nietzsche seems to which is that people seem to well Christians at least most of them seem to rather enjoy the idea of being God's slave. And it absolutely baffles me why. I mean, I've listened to many sermons, and a lot of them get into that. They say that they are God's servants, and it utterly baffles me. And from the last sentence in that paragraph, it looks like it baffles Nietzsche as well. Man gradually takes possession of the highest and proudest states of his soul, as also of his acts and his works. 
Formerly, it was believed that one paid oneself the greatest honor by denying one's own responsibility for the highest deeds one accomplished, and by ascribing them to God. So, this is another tenet of Christianity, at least most denominations, which is that you are no longer responsible for your actions because you're saved, and therefore, once you're saved, you, it doesn't matter what you do, you're basically guaranteed uh, to go into heaven. And it's basically a way of avoiding responsibility for one's actions. But moving on, the will which was not free appeared to be that which imparted the higher value to a deed. In those days, a god was postulated as the author of the deed. So, again, it was must be some ex thing external to you because it couldn't, couldn't have been you, and therefore we call this other thing God. Moving on, 138. Priests are the actors of something which is supernatural, either in the way of ideals, gods, or saviors, and they have to make people believe in them. In this, they find their calling. This is the purpose of their instinct. In order to make it cre as credible as possible, they have to exert themselves to the utmost extent in the art of posing. Their actor's sagacity must, above all, aim at giving them a clean conscience, by means of which alone it is possible to persuade effectively. So basically, it's the job of the priest to make this seem plausible to other people, uh, even though it really isn't plausible at all. And finally, note 139. The priest wishes to make it an understood thing that he is the highest type of man, that he rules even over those who wield the power, that he is indispensable and unassailable, that he is the strongest power in the community, not by any means to be replaced or undervalued. So basically, priest, just like any other human, is driven by power, and the priest therefore wants everybody else to think that they are the most important people in the community, that they can't be replaced. That's how they satisfy their desire for power. Means there too. He alone is cultured. He alone is a man of virtue. He alone has sovereign power over himself. He alone is, in a certain sense, God, and ultimately goes back to the Godhead. He alone is the middleman between God and others. The Godhead administers punishment to everyone who puts the priest at a disadvantage, or who thinks in opposition to him. So the first note in here is that one of the things is priests try to get a monopoly on virtue. This is, if any of you ever read Twilight of the Idols, there's a chapter in the evolution of the idea of truth, and one and virtue, and one of them is, truth is only attainable to the virtuous person, and that's an extension of Platonism, according to Nietzsche. But the other thing is that, by treating the priest as a kind of middleman between God and humanity, he's kind of putting himself into a position where, he I don't want to say he has God at his command, but basically he's thinking, Oh, well, if anybody does wrong to me, you know, God's going to punish them. Means there, too, truth exists. There is only one way of attaining to it, and that is to become a priest. Everything good which relates either to order, nature, or tradition is to be traced to the wisdom of the priest. The holy book is their work. The whole of nature is only a fulfillment of the maxims which it contains. No other source of goodness exists than the priest. Every other kind of perfection, even the warriors, is different in rank from that of the priest. So, again, the priests are trying to monopolize morality and truth. Consequence, if the priest is to be the highest type, then the degrees which lead to his virtue must be the degrees of value among men. Study, emancipation from material things, inactivity, impassibility, absence of passion, solemnity. The opposite of all this is found in the lowest type of man. So in other words, the priest is 
taking certain things which he considers virtuous, placing them at the highest. The most virtuous man is going to follow these things. And then everything which is the opposite of those things, that's something only a low human being would ever want to do. And it also shows Nietzsche was a critic of the idea that you can detach yourself from the material world, from your own passion. And he criticizes Christianity because they think he can. And I think that's kind of what he's getting into right here. And final paragraph. The priest has taught a kind of morality which conduced to his being considered the highest type of man. He conceived a type which is the reverse of his own, the shandala. By making these as contemptible as possible, some strength is once the order of caste. The priest's excessive fear of sex sensuality also implies that the latter is the most serious threat to the order of caste, so the order in general. Every free tendency overthrows the laws of marriage. There are a bunch of uh, things here. First of all, Nietzsche in my interpretation, is arguing that it is because of Christianity, because of religion, that we still have this conservative force in society, one that wants to maintain order even at the cost of liberty. But it gets even uh, more in-depth than that because he says every free tendency overthrows the laws of marriage. And that's kind of getting to, for example, in the early 20th century, interracial marriages was a kind of controversial issue, and it was mostly religious people who thought that marriage should only be between white or between black. And even more contemporary, we have the issue of gay marriage and lesbian marriage, because a lot of, uh, a lot of times you hear the argument that it's a threat to marriage. It's a threat to the family. In fact, almost every single anti-gay organization I can think of has the word family in its name. So you can tell that these people really uh, take, uh, call any form of sensuality other than the one that they narrowly want you to subscribe to as a threat to marriage, family, etc. So there you have it. That's my interpretation of these five uh, notes that appear in Nietzsche's Will to Power. And like I said, it's not the most in-depth I've done. I tried to do it as in-depth as I could quickly because, as I said, I am in a hurry trying to make the deadline here. Uh, yeah. Dr. Jason J. Campbell, uh, I do really enjoy your videos. Um, I haven't really gotten the opportunity to watch the entire Nietzsche uh, series that you're doing, uh, mostly because it's uh, like a lot of videos at the moment for me to watch, and I only found out about it from Secular Numinous just recently. But, uh, I hope that you use the this interpretation that I've just provided or not as you will and um bye